Um, <laughs> we are now recording. Um, okay, and then, um, so the next pieces are gonna be the barrier assessment and um, that's gonna be, uh, Matt O'Connor is gonna go into that in his discussion and um, channel conditions, wet dry channel conditions ended up being a really critical part of this study. Um, we had very variable weather over the course of this and we started in late 2018. The 2018-19 year was very different than the subsequent two uh, much drier years. So we ended up learning a lot about um, just the hydrology, how much of this watershed stayed wet, which was um, wonderfully surprising on the Honeyeb and Redwood side. Okay, so Matt's gonna go over the physical habitat and barrier assessment. And I'm gonna talk some about the water quality and um, Will from California Sea Grant will uh, talk about the biological monitoring. These are just all the pieces of our um, study. And then the draft restoration priorities will be covered by John Green and Matt and I. So I am going to stop sharing. Oh, and I didn't cover about questions. Um, so if you have questions, Please feel free to, I don't, if folks are familiar with raising their hand um, within the options, um, within the little square of your face, um, you can raise your hand and let us know that you have a question. Sophia, my coworker, is monitoring that um, just to make sure that folks that have that, especially if you've got a question that is really critical for you understanding before we move on. You can also use the chat box and then we're gonna have um, opportunities for folks to ask questions. Um, we have a whole section at the end, but if you have any questions that you need to ask between now and then, raise your hand or put it in the chat box and we'll be sure to ask the speaker. And I'm gonna turn it over to Arthur. All right, thanks, Sierra. And I'm just gonna jump right in because we got a lot to cover here. And let's see, there we go. Um, So as Sierra said, I'm, I looked into the historical ecology of, of um, and I, I really included both Atascadero and um, Green Valley because um, you know, they're all part of the same system. And there's a lot of question about uh, where all the sediments coming from <clears throat> that's causing um, you know, things to back up and causing inundation uh, upstream from, the, um, from our study area, uh, right at the, at the confluence of Green Valley and Atascadero. So, uh, I really went ahead and just looked at both of those. And um, so one of the surprising things, um, are you guys seeing all the faces on the right-hand side of the screen? Okay, let me see what I can do about that. Um, okay, so um, so one of the interesting things that came out of the, the research was that um, even though Atascadero means bog or swamp, um, and I found references to it going uh, as far back as 1853, um, I didn't find any good historical documentation of, of, a, of a marsh. Um, and and uh, well, let me back up a little bit here. Okay, so this is a map from 1866. And the names of these creeks have moved around a bit over the years. So what, what's called Green Valley Creek here, we today call Atascadero. And what down here is called Atascadero, that's now, now called Green Valley. And the upper part of Green Valley today is, is this uh, tributary over here. And I'm assuming people can see my cursor. Yes. Okay, so um, so it's a little bit confusing, but that's, uh, but I'll try to keep that all straight for folks. So um, so this is a Tascadero today, and you can see there's no, no mention of a marsh, no, no symbols for marsh, um, like the Laguna, you know, that's pretty well delineated over here. Um, and, you know, even in those days, um, you know, there was, symbols for marsh. This is over in Sonoma Valley, but this is the Kenwood Marsh. Uh, this is pretty clearly demarcated in an 1851 map, and I've seen these uh, other places. So, so that's just a little bit strange. Why, why don't we find any uh, mapped evidence of marsh, you know, going back to the beginning? Uh, and I don't have a great explanation other than that um, people settled there pretty early. Americans settled there quite early and may have already drained it uh, by the time the maps were made. And the earlier Mexican maps, if you're wondering, don't seem to show uh, anything either, really. So, um, so this is the first uh, mapped um, delineation of the marsh that I could find. It, it was uh, from this uh, Sebastopol quad that was surveyed in the early 1930s. And so here's uh, Green Valley Road. And here's, uh, this is Green Valley Creek coming down here, Tascadero Creek coming down there. 
And I just have these red marks to show you where sort of the, the edge of the marsh was in 1933. And um, so then we'll come forward to the 19, early 1950s. And you can see the marsh has now extended quite a ways upstream. Um, what was shown as marsh in the 1930s, uh, right here by the confluence, is now looking like riparian forest. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so it seems like something's happened during those 20 years. Um, and then if we go ahead to 1968, go another 15 years into the future, there's another little extension of the marshland um, upstream. So, um, you know, I, this is just speculation, but I, I know uh, to some extent people have thought that maybe the, the sediment plug uh, was formed in the 1980s. And I think that might've been the point when the symptoms really showed up, but, but I'm wondering if, um, you know, land use before that time, um, you know, if there were lots of impacts even before then, which I'll go into in a minute. And so it really was getting started um, as early as the 1920s or 1930s. And if you look on the most recent USGS uh, coverage, uh, the marsh, as they map, it doesn't really extend any further upstream. So it hasn't really changed much in the last uh, 50 plus years. So, um, so thinking about that sediment and thinking about the, whoops, the channel changes. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, this is probably the most interesting map that I found. Uh, this is 1867 county map, uh, earliest map of the whole county. And sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button there. Um, so here's, um, this is present day Green Valley Creek. This is Purrington Creek. And here's a Tascadero. And you can see they have confluences, separate confluences to Atascadero, which is of course no longer true. They, um, you know, Purrington is now a tributary of Green Valley Creek. Uh, but in 1867, uh, at least they were mapped as having separate confluences. And this uh, Purrington reach is really where, when uh, we get high flows these days, uh, that's where uh, Green Valley Creek overflows the road and then goes uh, directly into Tascadero. So um, it's following an old channel when it does that. Uh, this is kind of a conceptual look at that area. So here's 1867. Uh, Purrington and Green Valley are still separate. Here's a Tascadero. And these are just labeled reaches for those creeks. Uh, in 1877, um, things have changed a bit. Um, so there's still a mapping of the lower part of Purrington, but it's obviously been diverted so that it now meets Atascadero right about where Green Valley Creek does. And then by the time you get to 1898, um, both uh, Green Valley and Purrington are now flowing together to their confluence with Atascadero. And these numbers are just, um, just really rough estimates of how uh, those channel changes might have changed both the flow and the sediment load in these different reaches. So you have more sediment coming down uh, Green Valley Creek and then dumping in right here at this confluence of the Tascadero. Um, Purrington Creek, except it may be very high flows, this reach uh, had no, you know, no flow and no sediment contributions. Um, so that's just, a, just an attempt to kind of look at it conceptually of how that might have changed things uh, quite early on. And so, um, you know, I've come to think of it as, there's likely a number of contributing factors that formed that sediment wedge and are resulting in the inundation of the, of the seasonal wetland. Um, so we've got hydro modification uh, happening very early on. And this holds true in other parts of the county. So I, you know, this, I, would, I would bank on this, uh, these types of things happening really early on. Uh, we've got an intensifying land use. Uh, this is a 1953 topo map and you can see just the coverage of orchards in the area is, is uh, you know, it's most of the agricultural land or, or non, um, you know, uh, sort of creek bottom is, is all uh, orchards. So very intensive uh, orchard use. Um, some things were happening downstream that they're off of this map, but there is the horse crossing that was constructed downstream at the uh, Iron Horse Vineyard area. Uh, there is a berm constructed in the 1980s around uh, Lake Grayton, and then there's people messing around in the channel. And then also, um, you know, I, I've heard it said several times that, that the uh, inundation of Lake Grayton started in the 1980s, which is an interesting period because there was 
a very high rainfall. Um, the Halberg Butterfly Garden has rainfall data going back to 1926. And the three highest years in a row, or I should say the highest three year total is in 1981 to 1983. And I think 83 is the highest that they ever recorded, um, something like, I can't remember now, but maybe 95 inches. So there was a lot of water coming down in the 80s, which, which probably contributed to maybe, um, you know, all these things added together, plus this high rainfall, um, you know, really got the sediment wedge started um, in the 80s. But I, I think it also, uh, other factors were contributing uh, from well before that time. Um, so the final little bit here, I want to just touch on Selmonids. Um, there's you know, a good record for Selmonids going back to the 1850s um, when the first American pioneers arrived. Um, they talk about good fishing. They talk about um, salmon in Green Valley Creek and trout in Atascadero, which is interesting because um, that uh, distribution seems to hold up uh, pretty well with the, with the record that follows. Um, not that, that uh, you know, trout weren't sometimes found in um, Green Valley, and, um, and if there's a few records of salmon in Atascadero, but for the most part, they seem to have uh, kind of favored those streams. Um, and uh, so and then you go forward to the 19, uh, this is somebody I interviewed, Steve Stedman. So he said his dad used to like to fish for both salmon and trout in uh, Green Valley Creek. And someone else I talked to said that, who grew up in the same era, said that nobody ever tried to fish in Atascadero. Uh, during that period, um, unless you go really high up in the watershed. And then I talked to John Durkee, who's uh, spent a lot of his childhood on Redwood Creek and is still there uh, today. And he talks about catching salmon and steelhead um, in Redwood Creek. And there's, there's John right there uh, back in the 1950s. And then um, even as late as the 1960s, um, you know, there's reports of trout and salmon being common in Green Valley Creek. But then if, as you go forward, and this is, um, so this is all the observations of, of Salmonids that I could find in the record. So it includes um, family histories, it includes uh, newspaper records, uh, includes uh, interviews that I did, uh, includes uh, stream surveys, um, all that stuff. And again, you can see there's, you know, much stronger record of coho in Green Valley Creek, uh, you know, occasional mention um, in Atascadero. Um, and these are actually, um, let's see, yeah, with some out migrants here. Um, but by the 1960s, they were um, steelhead and coho were declining, um, you know, pretty much uh, not only in Atascadero and Green Valley, but, you know, th really throughout Sonoma County from what I've seen, that was a typical situation. Um, so I think that's my piece. That's just the highlights, a few of the highlights, and I tried to it into 10 minutes so uh, thanks for thanks for listening and happy to take questions uh, later on thanks arthur sounds exciting uh, that's some of the first that we've seen of that as well um, arthur's just finishing up his first run of the report which is going to be really cool to combine in with what we're learning um, Right. Can you guys see the screen share? Yeah. <laughs> Hoping that's true. Arthur, can you see it? I can. Yeah. I see I'll turn screen. off my microphone though, sir. Perfect. Okay. So this is, um, I'm going to be talking about the monitoring work that's been done and um, there's a good amount of it and it's going to be um, split between myself and Will from California Sea Grant. Um, he's going to be talking about the biological monitoring piece and I'm going to be talking about the water quality monitoring. Um, and I want to just familiarize you a little bit with what I'm going to be talking about because there's been a, there are a couple different approaches. There's instantaneous or grab sampling, which looks much like you would expect it to look. This is me standing on the edge of a bank, throwing a meter into the water um, and collecting data at that location at that time with a meter. Um, and it also includes collecting samples that we take back for lab analysis, um, like in this photo. And then the other type of monitoring we're going to be discussing is continuous uh, water quality monitoring. And that looks like here's John um, putting in one of those water quality meters um, that we can leave out in the creek. And this one's in a floating housing, but we're able to leave that 
meter in the stream and it collects data every 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the type of equipment that we leave out there. Um, so the benefits of these are for the instantaneous or grab sampling is that we can cover a lot of area, cover a lot of geographic area in a very short amount of time. And in the, with the continuous water quality monitoring, we get a lot of data record a lot over a long period of time, but in one specific location. So there's some trade-offs on each of those, um, but combining them has really helped us to um, learn more about the conditions. So this is the water quality, and I really apologize that there is not our regal should be sitting right here at this location to help you orient to all of these dots that I'm about to talk about. Um, but the main take home piece of this is that we took these instantaneous or grab samples primarily from public bridge crossings. And um, you can orient yourself. All of our uh, numbers start at the, the downstream end or the north, but which is the downstream end and they work their way upstream. So the larger numbers are farther upstream and the um, smaller numbers are downstream. Um, we had the instantaneous or grab sampling, which are denoted by these yellow dots throughout the watershed. And then the purple triangles show you where we had those water quality meters that we were able to deploy and leave in the stream. And we had that down in the Atascadero Marsh down here. And then one just downstream on, on Atascadero Creek, just downstream of Occidental Road and then up in Redwood Creek, um, just downstream of the Furlong Road um, bridge crossing, right where Forest Lane comes in. So just to give you an idea of where that is. And those are done with incredible um, generosity from the landowners that have allowed us to access um, those areas repeatedly because we have to go in and calibrate and field check those every month while they're out into the stream. So, um, we have two different ones. I'm going to show you guys a bunch of graphs, and I do not want them to be overwhelming in any way. If you have questions or an understanding any part of it or I'm going too fast, please let me know in the chat. But what I want to basically cover is just some of the trends and information that we've collected. So you're going to see a lot of station names. Everything's kind of denoted by these ATC, which always means Atascadero Creek. And then again, these numbers that move sequentially upstream. And then we have Puneev Creek, which is JOC, and Redwood Creek, which is REC. So you'll see those pictured on the graphs. Um, and those are just telling you which stations um, this information was collected at. So these are the water quality thresholds that we used. You're going to see a lot of red lines that are going to be crossing these graphs. And that's basically, we were collecting this data and comparing it to what sensitive and aquatic organisms um, like our coho, our steel, our coho salmon, steelhead trout, and freshwater shrimp, what they require. So cold water fisheries is kind of the lens that we're, we're looking at that we're setting a lot of these um, water quality objectives on. So you'll see objectives throughout there. And they're mostly based on the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board and the EPA. So here's an example of lots of <laughs> hard to read graphs, but I want the take home message of this is that um, we did temperature, we measured temperature in both the instantaneous and the continuous sampling. And um, water, the temperature is just really important for biological function and chemical function. It's one of the real drivers. So it's really important to understand what's happening with your temperature. And this is kind of the kind of data that's captured again, that has a large geographical extent that we did at each of these sampling events throughout the watershed. And then here's what the data output looks like from a continuous um, monitoring station where every dot along these lines is a data point. Um, but the take home message from this is that our threshold, our water quality objective is that we do not exceed 21.1 degrees or about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and Atascadero is cold consistently throughout the whole watershed. Um, it has really good temperature conditions, even down in the um, lower section where it's really open. There's not a lot of tree cover. The channel is very wide as it gets into that expanded wetland area. It's still really cold. Um, so that's a parameter that's really difficult to change. Once it warms up, it's very difficult to cool it back down. So the fact that it stays cool um, is good news. There it goes. It's going to advance slowly. OK. Um, another parameter, a basic parameter that we measured was pH, um, and we did this both continuously and instantaneously. Um, and one of the things that I just wanted to point out, so the, there's two water quality objectives for pH. 
Um, and if you will remember from your high school chemistry class, pH um, is a logarithmic scale and um, you have basically seven is in the middle um, and that's neutral and things that are above seven are um, alkaline or basic and things below seven are acidic. Um, and so the water quality objectives between, you wanna have your water, your um, water quality conditions falling between these two red lines, because that's basically where most animal species function optimally is between that 6.5 and 8.5. Um, and what we're seeing down in the marsh is that we are getting into pretty acidic conditions as the year progresses. So as we start to get into the late spring and into the summer, um, we're seeing acidic conditions. Um, and this is largely due from what we can tell so far, um, that it is due to how much vegetation is down there and that the um, decaying vegetation, this bacterial respiration that's associated with the decaying vegetation gives off carbon dioxide, which creates more acidic conditions. And then the dissolved oxygen, which I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides, when that gets really low, um, it favors um, hydrogen sulfide um, production, which also creates more acidic conditions. So. Some of, these can, some of these water quality objectives we're finding are not um, actually very reflective or fair to hold the Atascadero marsh to because it is functioning like a marsh, not like a creek. So that's one of the things we have a special study that we're working on with still water sciences that will continue past this um, study as this one kind of winds down. We're starting up another one that's hopefully gonna give us some more information about um, how the marsh, what kind of conditions we can expect in the marsh. Um, if you move a little bit upstream, um, this is that Atascadero 27 site, which is just downstream of Occidental Road, and the, uh, the pH conditions are well within range of exactly what we're looking for as you move upstream, and the same was true of, of Redwood Creek. So dissolved oxygen, we're going to talk a good amount about dissolved oxygen because we know that this is an issue in Atascadero. This was one of the first things that we were aware of. Um, coming into this from past um, monitoring of work that's been done primarily on Green Valley Creek, is that Atascadero Creek um, has a lot of dissolved oxygen variability. So dissolved oxygen talks, is referring to the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the water and that's available for the aquatic organisms to breathe. So it's just as important as the amount of oxygen for terrestrial organisms that are in our air. Um, and it's added through added into the water through turbulence and through oxygenated water um, moving into an area and from photosynthesis of plants, um, but also that photosynthesis, photosynthesis can remove oxygen when it goes into it, it, when it starts to decay, it can actually consume oxygen. Um, so having a lot of plant and algal um, presence and growth in your um, stream or your uh, aquatic area, um, as you can very much see here, this is that same um, meter that I was showing um, John deploying by, from a kayak earlier in the season, and the entire waterway just fills up with um, Ludwigia, which is a non-native invasive plant, um, and Azola, it's just completely dense out there to the point where you can't even boat through it. So we are seeing a lot of excessive um, aquatic plant growth in this lower section. So this ranges just for, to give you an idea for fish, this is talking about brown trout in this um, but it was a nice little visual that gives you an idea that we're on a spectrum. So you're going to see again a lot of red lines that are going to talk about like thresholds and water quality objectives. But all of this is on a threshold of how much oxygen is needed for certain sensitive species. And if they fall below a certain level, those species just cannot inhabit that area. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is what I was talking about about the earlier. So this falls outside of our study area. This first was from 2009 to 2011. And um, the main thing I want you to just be able to see from this is that the yellow is the Atascadero lines. So if you look at the yellows, you can see there's just a huge amount of variability seasonally. That during the, the winter months, you, it would come up during these storms and then it would go down during the summer. Um, and much more so than you see Green Valley Creek at Green Valley Road is the blue and green is Green Valley Creek at Ross Station Road. So the thing we were looking at in this was how much is green, how much is the Tascadero affecting Green Valley Road upstream and downstream of where it, it's at its confluence. And you can see that it is having some impact on the Green Valley um, downstream. But the main thing that we really noticed was, yikes, okay, we gotta look more, we gotta understand the dissolved oxygen here a bit more. So one of the things when we first started this study, so we started in late 2018, and we went out and we were, we were measuring um, the dissolved, we were basically going out during storm events because we wanted to get an idea of kind of what was coming into the watershed, what was being fed into 
um, the Atascadero Creek. And so this is just picking out these four locations, Water Trough, Mill Station, Occidental, sorry, Great, by Grayton and Green Valley Roads. Um, and these are the locations that we were taking and we were finding that we were, you know, everything was going fine until we got out to Green Valley and it was just, it was not representative. And then as soon as we were taking these, I like, put this in because this really illustrates that once this is the Green Valley, um, the ATC 10 or Green Valley Road sample, and it just had not received any kind of, of stormwater yet. So it's absolutely stormwater in the upper part of the watershed and it's not has not made it down to Green Valley. So we were sampling Green Valley, but it was not representative of the storm. So OEI, um, O'Connor Environmental, um, deployed a stage gauge, which gives us information about the stream level down in the marsh. And they found that this is, I know, hard to look at, but the main thing to take a look at here is that the red line is rainfall, peak rainfall, and then the blue line is the stream level that corresponds to that. And there was a 14 to 16 hour delay between when we were seeing these peak flows in the upper watershed and when we were seeing them down in the marsh. So there's this really large, it's really flat. There's a lot of area where it connects to its floodplain. There's a number of places where it floods out and then needs to make it either through a bridge um, construction area or it's still trying to move through. So it takes a while for those floodwaters to get down to the bottom. Another nutty looking graph, but this is basically just comparing stage, which we were just looking at, which is again, the stream flow level and the dissolved oxygen because we have that floating um, water quality meter down in the marsh. And it was showing that as, when stage would come up, when it would actually, that storm water would reach um, down into the marsh, we would get these big bumps and corresponding bumps in dissolved oxygen. So that storm water, which we often think about in terms of pollutants and things we're worried about delivering to the stream, in Atascadero's case, that storm water also brings with it really needed oxygenated water. And this works during relatively wet years, like 2018-19. So if you're a fish and you're coming down Atascadero Creek, you've got some of these, you've got these windows that you can get through the marsh with enough, enough oxygen to get down to Green Valley Creek. And that works okay during your relatively wet years. The following year in 2019-20, um, which was a much drier year, and you were getting these dissolved oxygen windows that are much shorter, fewer, and far between. So um, we knew this was an issue and we were looking at it and we knew that in May of, uh, May of 2019 that there was gonna be a really nice spring storm and that, that we were looking really interested in how coho were handling this marsh area because we were like, wow, there's just not a lot of oxygen down here, um, but we are seeing it in these storms. So we wanted to really monitor, drill in and monitor around this storm event in May of 2019. So we went out before it rained and the dissolved oxygen again, uh, Atascadero at Green Valley Road is in yellow was really, really low. Started raining, everything's looking really good on May 16th and it, we get a bump in oxygen um, on May 16th, um, but it was really slow coming up and then it starts to come right back down. And that's the, the same trend that we had seen. Um, unfortunately, while we were out there monitoring from the bridge, we saw a whole, we saw 12 coho um, that were dead and that were floating on the surface of a Tuscadero Creek at Green Valley. So we were really concerned that whatever was coming down with the storm water, um, that it was not, that it was going to kill all the coho that were trying to make it through the marsh. It was really upsetting. Will gets to tell the happier part of the story, but that's my part. Um, so we came out here and um, we took a look, we pulled, downloaded all the data from, um, from the, the monitor. We saw that the actual bump in oxygen, again, we were talking about that delay so it was raining on the 16th, but it was the 17th, 8th, it was like the 18th, 19th when we started to get a bump in that oxygen. So fish that came down early with that, start, with that storm water, when they, they basically hit an anoxic wall at the, um, at the Tascadero, at the marsh. And the ones that came down later with that oxygenated water were able, more of those were able to make it through. And again, Bill, we'll talk to you more about that. And this is Derek. Hey there. Um... I was partnering with Sierra on a separate planning effort because uh, just downstream of um, Green Valley Road, there's the Atascadero State Ecological Reserve, which is a property owned by um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And access to that property was really easy. And that's the emerging wetland area down there. We were trying to, we were curious about water quality in that specific spot. So 
we walked out along um, the levee with our meter and got a bunch of grab samples and found that the water quality in terms of dissolved oxygen was low um, pretty much wherever we looked along the levee. So we decided to come back later with a boat and we got uh, dissolved oxygen samples throughout the property from a boat. And we found once we were floating around that the values varied, but generally they were all low all throughout the property. So then we thought, well, shoot, if it's low everywhere on the property, well, and it's got to be good somewhere else. So we gave up trying to do lots of samples on the property and we went out to all the easy to access locations up and down the Atascadero Creek. So basically bridges where we could um, stash a car as on as much of the shoulder was available and drop a meter off the edge of the bridge and get a water sample, take notes and then move on to the next spot. So all these circles represent um, grab samples on one day um, that we took in here up on the map, it says it's May 31st. And so we aimed, um, I think for once a month and then we upped it to once a week. And as we progressed along throughout the year, we added more sites because we had more questions. Um, basically, dissolved oxygen was better earlier in the season than you know the winter and the spring. But as summer progressed along, um, we found that low dissolved oxygen areas uh, expanded in geographic scope, um, and the dissolved oxygen kept getting lower and lower throughout the year until. Um, late in the season we found that basically most all of Atascadero Creek had not just poor but just lethal dissolved oxygen levels. Um, you'll notice down on the lower quarter of the page there's a yellow circle with a 4.4 or 4.6 in there and the water quality was still far below optimal but it was better than everything around it. And what we're figuring is, is that Honeve Creek, all the tributaries to Atascadero have relatively good water quality. And they were able to chip away at the poor water quality and improve it slightly for a short distance along Atascadero Creek. Um, and so that was really interesting to find out, but it also raised further questions. So we know what the water quality is like at these easy to get to bridge locations, but those are spaced kind of far apart. And um, we're curious to see if there's better water quality conditions in the in-between spots. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna work with Sierra in the future to try and identify um, some landowners that would want us out there to do grab samples to try and see if in between the bridges is any different than what we have at the bridge. Um, and maybe that'll help us answer some questions as to what's going on out there in the watershed. Great, thank you, Lauren. I'm gonna speak through because I need to see we're about five minutes behind and I don't wanna short Will because he's got some of the more fun parts to talk about. Um, this is so this is exactly what, what Derek was just saying about other parts of the watershed. Um, this is again, our continuous water quality um, data that we took and this is um, ATC, ATC27 is just downstream of Occidental Road um, crossing and Redwood Creek is up at um, Redwood Creek at Furlong Road. And um, the important part to note about this is just that, that this lower section never had dissolved oxygen in the times that was the time that we were monitoring it. This has two years on it. 2020 is in green and 2021 is in yellow. Um, it dried, the creek dried up um, in 2021 at this location where it runs out of yellow. Um, and the main thing to take from this is just that that area just doesn't have conditions that would support these sensitive aquatic organisms during the summertime. And not all parts of the watershed are expected to perform at all parts of the life cycle of these sensitive species either. But this tells us when we're starting to kind of drill down to take a look at these locations that, that these are areas that are not going to sustain um, these sensitive species that we're, we're looking for habitat to sustain. Up in Redwood Creek, which we know has generally really good habitat, we saw some really variable information. So this is um, Redwood Creek in 2020 is the dark blue and 2021 is the light blue. And what we saw was that we would hit these really warm periods and we would start to see these, the reason this looks so jagged is because these are diurnal fluctuations. So each day we'd be going from something that was in pretty good dissolved oxygen on the, the top end of this spike here and then it would drop down and it would do this every single day. 
This was not in the best habitat. There were pools and other locations where the fish could have been hanging out. I put this meter cut in a pretty well mixed area because I was trying to get kind of an idea of not where the very best spots were, but kind of what it looked like throughout. Um, so looking at opportunities for ways to keep the dissolved oxygen and temperature conditions in this optimal range that we're seeing early on in the summer and not have it so impacted by the warmer temperatures and lower flows is one of the restoration recommendations that John's going to talk about at the end, um, looking at ways to protect and enhance those flow conditions. Last thing I'm going to talk about is nutrients. Um, and I wanted to just cover nutrients. Um, come from a variety of sources. Um, we took samples during all of those grab sampling, um, sampling events to take a look um, at whether we were seeing these pollutants coming into the watershed. Um, and we measured ammonia, nitrate, and orthophosphate, which are pretty um, standard um, nutrients to take a look at. Um, and they're not directly toxic to organisms, but they are um, things that are biostimulatory, which means that they, once when you have high enough concentrations of them, they will create conditions that grow that algae and excessive aquatic plant growth that we're seeing happening down in the marsh. Um, and so um, we were looking just to try to get an idea um, and that eutrophication again leads to these low dissolved oxygen um, conditions that are, are really concerning that deplete all of that oxygen out of the water. So sources of that can include fertilizers, from agriculture, gardens, lawns, soaps, um, from wastewater treatment systems. A lot of these things can be bound to sediment particles. They can be legacy issues. So come in with sediments um, that erode in during storm events. But basically what we found was that there were excessive nutrients coming in from basically every part of the watershed. So each one of these um, is a, a storm event that we sampled. And then it has all of these different locations that we sampled at. And the ones that were mostly of concern are the orange and the yellow, because that's Honeave Creek and Atascadero Creek. And then Redwood Creek is this kind of blue color. But we were seeing exceedances of orthophosphate coming in from basically everywhere. So we know that there's, there's a good amount of, of kind of plant fertilizer that's coming through. And the nitrate results were similar in that the, we were seeing a lot of exceedances. So that just tells us that it's something we need to understand a little bit more and we're going to try to get a little bit better at sourcing where is that what that's coming from but the types of things um, that folks can look at are um, what kind of things they're applying to their gardens lawns crops understanding their wastewater whatever their on-site wastewater treatment system is their septic and looking at the types of soaps that you're using in your laundry and in your um, kitchen the thing about a Tascadero is that it floods frequently, so it does not just stay in the creek. It comes onto your property and invades your gardens and spaces. Um, and so it's connecting to a lot more land uses um, next to it than a lot of other things. It's not you know, just road runoff, it's actually coming and, it, and flooding onto the road. So it's just an extra um, amount of awareness that we need to have within this watershed, um, which our city is located in as well as my home of what we're, we're using on our um, using in our homes and gardens. And I am going to turn this over now to Will. Right. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, um, well, uh, thanks everyone for being here and thanks Sierra for hosting tonight. Um, my name is Will Boucher and I'm a fisheries biologist for California Sea Grant's Russian River Salmon and Steelhead Monitoring Program. Um, tonight, I wanted to start off by introducing our program and broadly the monitoring that we do within the Russian River watershed. Um, then I wanted to take a little bit of time to um, cover some of our methods for monitoring coho. And then lastly, I wanted to dive into the status of the Atascadero Creek um, and some of the monitoring that we've been doing um, in the upper watershed thus far. Um, so the Russian River Salmon and Steelhead Monitoring Program, um, we're a small uh, program. There's about a dozen of us. I mean, we, we work out of Windsor. Um, our program um, aims to monitor um, salmonid status trends um, across uh, all different life stages. Um, and uh, one of our primary goals is we want to try to identify any uh, recovery bottlenecks um, that might be impeding uh, coho from uh, recovering in the Rus Russian River watershed. Um, and then uh, we also want to evaluate salmonid recovery efforts. Um, this could be um, habitat enhancement work, um, streamful augmentation projects, um, stuff such as that. Um, and then as we're seeing tonight, um, there's a lot of different groups working 
um, on uh, restoration and recovery of um, not just fish, but the general watershed as a whole. Um, so um, we collaborate with multiple agencies um, in, in our efforts. Um, just so a little background information, uh, the Russian River Falls uh, within the Central California coast. Is, okay, sorry, I'll continue. Um, Central California Coast ESU. Um, the ESU stands for Evolutionary Significant Unit. Um, historically, coho salmon returns to the Russian River were thought to be in the tens of thousands. Um, but by the early 2000s, um, the, the returns were down to as little as 20. Um, and in 2004, um, the Army Corps of Engineers established the captive uh, broodstock program with fish that originated from uh, Green Valley and Dutch Bill Creeks, which are the ones highlighted down here. Um, and then in 2005, uh, Central California Coast Coho um, were listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, and since then, we've started seeing a slight recovery in the population of coho in the Russian River um, and the distribution in which uh, in the streams that they're occupying, but it's still nowhere near the, the historic levels that we're seeing. Um, and so here we have a, a graph of uh, the adult returns that um, we estimate coming back to the Russian River. Um, as you can see in the early 2000s, there are very few adults coming back to the Russian um, and then following the inception of the broodstock program, we started seeing um, results of that. And we started seeing adults coming back to the Russian River. Um, and I just want to note here that um, some of you may be wondering what observed and estimated is. Um, we get our estimates based off of pit tag detections, which pit tags are passive integrated transponder tags that are implanted inside coho um, from the broodstock program at Warm Springs. But I'm going to dive into that a little bit more here in a second. I just wanted to show the general trend of what Coho have been doing in the Russian River. Um, so Green Valley Creek um, is one of four uh, high priority life cycle monitoring streams in the basin. Um, and what this means is um, we kind of take a deeper dive into the life cycle monitoring and um, across all different life stages within the creek. And so uh, in doing that, we install uh, pit tag antennas to track fish that are coming in and leaving um, those watersheds. And then throughout the year, we do um, a series of, uh, of surveys to kind of monitor at the different life stages. So currently um, we're in the middle of winter. So we're doing our walking uh, red or spawner surveys where we have field crews walk the creeks and look for uh, adult salmon in their, in their reds or their nests that they're building in the streams. Um, in the spring months, we install downstream migrant traps um, to catch or intercept um, smolts that are emigrating from these streams and we can get a kind of an abundance for how many fish are leaving the stream, you know, how much they've grown over the winter, information uh, like that. Um, and then in the summer months, um, we do juvenile snorkel surveys to look at the abundance and distribution of juvenile coho um, in the stream. And then as we get towards the fall, we typically start seeing our lowest flows, our um, stream flow conditions of the year. So we uh, do walking surveys to document surface stream flow conditions in those streams. Um, and I just wanted to note that Atascadero Creek was not included in the initial recovery plan. So the monitoring that we've been doing in there has been fairly limited. It's, it's not as extensive as, as what we have for uh, Green Valley Creek. Um, so passive integrated transponder tags um, or pit tags, so I'll probably just call them that going forward, but uh, they're implanted in 15% or roughly 15% of uh, broodstock uh, coho that are um, from Warm Springs. Um, and each tag has a unique number. Um, and this is kind of a unique opportunity for us to have a essentially a name to a fish. Um, and so um, throughout that fish's entire life, we can um, track um, where, where it is, when it was somewhere. Um, and we can use the, because we have a known proportion of tags that are implanted in fish, we can generate estimates for how many fish are returning and or leaving. Um, so that's really valuable information for us. Um, and we operate antennas throughout the watershed so we can kind of track movement and um, you know, the usage of these different streams throughout the watershed. Um, and Sonoma Water also has um, antennas that um, it's kind of a joint effort throughout the, the lower Russian. Um, and one benefit that pit tag antennas have is that um, they operate 24 seven. So during large storms on the weekends, um, doesn't matter, the antennas are hopefully still running and 
in collecting data for us. So um, it's definitely a big advantage for them. Um, another monitoring method that I wanted to highlight um, this evening is our wetted habitat mapping. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have a field crew walk the stream um, and they're essentially documenting the presence or absence of surface stream flow. So is the creek wet or is it dry? Um, and along that survey, um, our crews are collecting discharge, dissolved oxygen, and temperature readings. Um, and kind of the end result um, is a map such as this. So this map here illustrates the surface stream flow conditions in Green Valley Creek um, this October. Um, and the uh, blue lines represent sections of stream that had continuous stream flow. Um, yellow indicates um, sections of creek that are intermittent um, or dry in the riffles in between pools. And then we have the red, which is completely dry. There's no water whatsoever. So as you can see, um, Green Valley Creek um, had some pretty serious um, flow impairment issues come um, this fall. Um, and I also just wanted to note that um, even though a section of creek was uh, considered wet or intermittent, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that the, the habitat within those uh, sections of creek were suitable for coho. We could have depleted dissolved oxygen or um, high temperature levels. So I just wanted to, to note that. Um, our crews started looking into uh, the tr headwater tributaries to the Atascadero watershed in around 2017. Um, and some of our like initial reconnaissance uh, surveys that we did up there were, were promising. And so um, we decided to uh, start looking into um, some metrics such as temperature um, and surface stream flow. So um, from our monitoring methods or uh, results so far, um, we've seen that yes, redwood and honeyeb can provide adequate temperatures for um, coho salmon um, in the upper watershed. Um, and, it, and actually um, redwood, Creek is um, cooler than Upper Green Valley, which is the blue line here. Um, and yeah, we don't have data after this point because the temperature logger actually dried out in the stream. So, um, and then this here is a map of uh, Redwood Creek for our surface stream flow. Um, and yeah, there was no disconnections um, in Redwood. Um, we didn't do any wetted habitat mapping in Honeeve Creek, but anecdotal observations showed that it was pretty much completely wet through at least downstream of the Redwood Creek confluence. Um, so the combination of continuous stream flow and um, cool temperatures within the Russian River is, is really rare. We don't really see that much. Um, and so that's kind of why these streams have piqued the, our interest. Um, and so given that, um, it, or given that uh, the proximity within uh, the Green Valley Creek watershed and the over summer rearing conditions that these headwater streams can uh, potentially provide juvenile coho salmon, um, a deci decision was made to start releasing coho into Redwood Creek in 2017. And ever since then, um, we or the uh, captive broodstock program um, has been releasing between two and 4,000 um, coho per year um, in, in Redwood. Um, one of the difficulties that um, Coho release in Redwood Creek encounter is that, is that they have to navigate through the Tascadero Creek on their journey to the ocean as a smolt, and they also have to go back through as an adult. So um, as Sierra and Derek outlined here um, in their presentation, um, Tascadero Creek can have highly fluctuated um, conditions that fish might have to encounter um, on their migration. And these um, turbulent conditions can coincide with the timing at which um, coho are passing through. Um, they're not necessarily living in a Tascadero Creek, but at some point in their life cycle, they do have to pass through if they want to reach um, the stream in which they are stocked in redwood. Um, and so um, the way that we've been monitoring this is through pit tag antennas. Um, and so throughout the Green Valley watershed, we have um, a network of nine pit tag antennas. Um, arrays. And so we can kind of break down these different sections and look at, you know, how are fish going through Tascadero Creek um, and navigating that system. Um, and so um, we've had a couple of years of data built up on this so far. Um, back in uh, the 2018 cohort, so fish that were uh, leaving in spring of 2019, um, we detected 383 individuals passing by Honeeve Creek, um, our antennas on Honeeve Creek here. Um, However, only 73 of those, or 19% of those, 
fish that were emigrating that um, spring made it down to our um, site on Lower Green Valley Creek. So, um, and also just a reminder, 2019, we had a, a, a rain event in May, which was, I think it was like four or five inches, was kind of unseasonally um, high for that time of year. So even with that storm, you know, we still had some, some fish made it through, which is great. Um, however, there was still a pretty significant loss in between. Um, and since then, um, 2020 and 2021, um, we haven't, we didn't have a single fish um, that was detected at Honeve Creek make it down to uh, Lower Green Valley Creek. So um, the migration success for fish through Atascadero Creek is, uh, seems to be really highly dependent on those uh, spring rain events um, and the conditions that um, they have to pass through in Atascadero Creek. Um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly touch on some of our snorkeling survey results. Um, we haven't really seen that much um, in Honeve or Redwood in terms of coho. Um, essentially near zero. Um, steelhead numbers have been low, um, and if anything, there's just been a slight decline um, in the few years that we've been monitoring. Um, so yeah, not a whole lot. Um, we're still, you know, hopeful that, you know, the future you know, can bring some better results, but um, yeah, so even with all that being said, it's not all bad news. Um, in the 2019-2020 and then the 2020-2021 winners, um, we estimated that five adult coho um, that originated from Redwood Creek, uh, returned to the Russian River. Um, so even though we are documenting that there are some issues with um, passage through Tascadero Creek, um, there are still some fish completing their life cycle. Um, and so I just wanted to just share this little brief video here. Um, this was taken last week and a tributary to the lower Russian River. Um, coho are kind of coming back right now to spawn and um, some of our field crews actually saw some spawning fish today. So um, yeah, um, I guess that's all I have. I wanted to keep it really brief, but I guess we can do questions later as well. Well, can you just really quickly mention though that the, about the redwood that seen the year old fish in redwood? Yes, oh. yeah, yes, yeah. So um, in the 2019-2020 winter, um, we estimated that five adult fish came back to um, Honeve Creek. So we had, we had adult fish um, detected moving through Green Valley uh, Creek through Tascadero and then up into, successfully up into um, Honeve Creek. So we didn't um, encounter a juvenile um, coho after that, but we also didn't survey the entire uh, upper watershed. Um, so, yeah, so it was encouraging to see fish come back and make it into upper um, Honeve Creek um, that winter. And then the following year, we had an, an adult or five, an estimated five adult coho um, come back and return um, and deter into Dry Creek as opposed to going into um, a Redwood Creek. So, you know, even though they might not be coming back there, they, they could still be contributing to the population in other places. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Will. That's all I have. All right. And the other thing is just about them being able to live year round in, in Redwood, seeing the 2017 fish come out in 2019. Yeah. If, if you wanted, do you want me to elaborate yeah. on that a little bit? Yeah. So um, with the coho life cycle, they typically keep to a three year life cycle where they'll emigrate and um, migrate out to the ocean as a one year old fish. So they'll, the parents will come back in the winter, say right now, um, the offspring of that um, cohort will rear in the summer. Um, through the following summer and, and through the, stay in the stream through the winter. And then the following spring, they'll migrate out to the ocean um, and then they'll come back a few years later as an adult. Um, one thing that we're seeing in Honeve and Redwood Creek is that um, we're seeing fish stay for a second year. So um, fish you know, that would typically leave are actually staying for a whole nother summer. Um, and they're living, you know, it's it, uh, as a whole nother year in that system. And so um, that's something that's typically, it's, 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 it's pretty rare, but it's seen in some other places that are highly productive during the summer months where, you know, fish decide to, to stay and, uh, and grow. Um, but yeah, it's something that we're kind of looking into a little bit more. We don't really know whether it's like a decision or more of a, we couldn't, you know, get out because of the conditions in Atascadero Creek. But it's still interesting nonetheless, and um, we are seeing not just a few, but like, um, you know, 
potentially in the realm of what, the hundreds of fish doing that. So um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting feature that we're definitely kind of just curious and in, in looking into as we you know, further our monitoring in that watershed. Thanks, Will. I'm terribly mm -hmm. short of Matt's time. So I have a feeling we're gonna run a bit over. Um, and if folks do not, can't stay and need to have questions that aren't answered, please email them and I will pass them around to the panel if you're not able to stay for the whole question phase. Sorry about that, Matt, please. Okay, got myself unmuted. Um, yes, I am going to move uh, very quickly through numerous slides to try to catch up here and not have this run too long. And I'm going to be talking about three sort of separate items. Uh, one is a, a study we did about uh, the best places to do groundwater recharge uh, through managing stormwater runoff. Uh, I have a very short uh, discussion about uh, uh, passage barriers uh, analysis we did focus on LIDAR and then a longer set of slides uh, breaking Atascadero Creek up into what I'm calling hydrogeomorphic units, hydrogeomorphic classifications that are sort of slanted towards how these uh, different parts of the Atascadero might get used by fish and how or how suitable they are for fish. Um, and uh, with that introduction, I'm just going to launch in here. You can see my screen, I presume. And let's see if I can uh, get this to work here. Um, so uh, the recharge enhancement uh, study uh, teared off some modeling work that we had done previously. And um, it, it, its basic concept is trying to identify where is uh, groundwater recharge feasible? Where does, uh, where does groundwater recharge generate summer base flows? And, and where on the landscape may there have already been some hydro modification? And uh, those three sets of things, uh, where, where if they all intersect in this Venn diagram, that's sort of a optimal target for, for groundwater recharge enhancement projects. Um, oh, okay. Uh, sorry. I'm having a hard time here getting my uh, uh, PowerPoint control. I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment. Excuse me. about that. So uh, the recharge enhancement prioritization, is, uh, we decided to use recharge work that we had done before from a model that integrated all the hydrology processes. Uh, we used that model to identify where uh, stream flow gets generated uh, based on groundwater recharge and focused uh, largely on, on where where stream flow gets generated in the summer um, for, for the ability for fish to, to use it. And uh, where on the landscape, uh, looking at kind of uh, uh, parcel sizes and what uh, activities occur on those parcels, um, where opportunities may exist. Uh, this is a, a map of groundwater recharge from the model I referred to. It's uh, uh, the, the bright colors are areas of uh, low recharge correlating mostly to valley bottoms where there are uh, layers of clay, uh, silt and clay that uh, make groundwater recharge harder to happen. And most of the upland areas uh, in the Wilson Grove formation 
sandstone uh, are pretty receptive to groundwater recharge. So much, much of the watershed has good potential. Um, this map is also from our uh, ground uh, uh, hydrologic model and shows uh, uh, on an annual basis where stream flow is, uh, is uh, there's a, a lot of stream flow generation where the blue lines are. Uh, there's a little bit of, of summer water coming in uh, where the where the green spots are and those orange areas are what we call losing streams where uh, there's net loss of water to the groundwater. So those those areas in blue helped us generate this subwatershed map uh, that uh, the, these uh, light blue subwatersheds that generate most of the uh, groundwater that feeds uh, this the summer base flow that is so extraordinary in Atascadero Creek. Um, and uh, so the, the land use part of this involved looking at uh, uh, three different characteristics, how, how big a property is, uh, reasoning that uh, the bigger the property, the more opportunity there would be to do something uh, useful with the water. Uh, we uh, came up with a way to estimate how much road length might be associated with a given parcel, thinking about sort of driveways and access roads being another, uh, another source of uh, runoff that could be manipulated to benefit. And then uh, looking at areas where there are ag uses with the presumption that ag use may, uh, may be an indicator of hydro modification and other sort of existing drainage controls that might be able to be taken advantage of as well. Um, so we rolled those things together into a scoring system uh, which is this uh, table up here. This is the distribution of the data. I'm not gonna go into those details. Um, suffice to say, we get to this map, which is a, uh, uh, a summary map prioritizing parcels based on the expected uh, opportunity for, for a recharge project, going from minimal in orange up to uh, the highest opportunity in that teal color. Um, and and uh, we grayed out some areas in these watersheds where uh, our, in, our information indicates low recharge. Um, and again, this is just a, this is a, a, a prioritization intended to help uh, identify uh, areas where uh, the best opportunities exist, um, which isn't, uh, uh, but there, we believe there is opportunity on every parcel. Um, the, the, the goal is to manage runoff in ways that maximize, maximize groundwater recharge. Um, the details for each site will be very specific, can be very small scale to something like uh, routing runoff to a, a small reservoir that acts like an infiltra infiltration basin. So this is kind of a jumping off point um, and it, it isn't intended to be a substitute for uh, visiting a site in the field understanding what's really going on, a, on with a site, what may already be going on there, and importantly, whether the soil characteristics of a site are uh, like what our map information says they are, or maybe quite different. Um, I'm gonna finish up this part of the talk by just uh, giving a very uh, simple example of what these kind of groundwater recharge enhancement projects might look like, hypothetical parcel, uh, uh, probably on a, on a ridge or a hill, stream draining it, uh, some, some vineyards. Over here, we have kind of the existing drainage patterns uh, with some uh, subsurface drains leading to channels that go into, the, into a creek, through a vineyard, uh, runoff along the road. And uh, you know, a, a treatment for this to encourage recharge might involve uh, disconnecting this road uh, from uh, the, the runoff that might be going through the vineyard and getting it uh, to, to spread out and infiltrate higher on the hillside. Um, places where water is already collected, perhaps uh, there is the uh, construction of some uh, infiltration swales or an infiltration pond. Um, there are many variations on this going on many different scales. It's a very site specific thing, but that is the essence of that. Uh, the next uh, component of this, which is going to be a real short bit here, is uh, we, we wanted to uh, have a look at whether there are 
passage barriers for, for fish that uh, could be identified using LIDAR. We're kind of LIDAR crazy and use it for a lot of different purposes. Um, and this is another one of them. The uh, essence of this was to try to, uh, without going places in the field, site access was very limited, to, to come up with at least a preliminary map of potential uh, migration barriers. There, there um, have been, in different parts of the watershed, uh, been some old uh, dams, uh, flashboard dams usually, um, that have been located. And um, we had the opportunity in a couple of cases to uh, see what the, the LIDAR signal was for uh, a known barrier. And that gave us something to look for in, in the LIDAR. And uh, that led to um, this uh, map of possible or potential migration barriers. Um, uh, and these are very uncertain. Um, the, there's a lot of uh, vegetation obstructive, uh, there's a lot of difficulty in discriminating what's really a barrier to uh, just uh, idiosyncrasies in the LIDAR signals that come back. Um, but this, uh, the, the color coding on these dots is just uh, going from yellow where maybe there's something there to red where it looks like um, there's a, a bigger possibility of, a, of an actual barrier being present. Um, we uh, were able to do some field work where access was available um, in this map, uh, though on first inspection, it may not look very different from the prior map, but uh, the, the story with this is that most of the places where we were able to get access in the field to, uh, to e examine the stream and look for barriers, we didn't find them. So uh, probably uh, many of these potential barriers that are still on this map um, aren't anything. Uh, but we're not sure. Now, there are a couple that we know of for sure up here uh, in, where Barnett Valley Road crosses up a Upper Atascadero Creek. And um, these three tributaries all um, get blocked at some point um, with uh, uh, obstructions or nick points in the channel that uh, create barriers. Um, there are some other kinds of barriers that aren't, uh, aren't so discrete as these that we'll be talking about. Um, which are more um, migration and water quality barriers that create barriers to migration. Okay, um, now hydrogeomorphic controls. This is the, the bigger part of my presentation. And uh, I'm not sure hydrogeomorphic is a word in the dictionary, um, but uh, it seems to fit uh, my purpose here. So if for, forgive me for introducing a new term. Um, the, the idea here is just that there are some pretty major uh, factors that control whether fish can use parts of Atascadero Creek, as, as we've seen from some of the prior presentations. Um, quantity, of timing, quantity and timing of stream flow, uh, shape and dimensions of the stream channel, the earth materials that form the stream bed and character of vegetation are the principal ones that, um, that I focused on to, to try to create this classification of the channel network according to these hydrogeomorphic characteristics. Um, and we, we basically analyzed and synthesized available data to come up with this. And uh, I mentioned the previous hydrologic modeling, which was very helpful. The analysis of sources of stream flow, which I just discussed a little while ago. Uh, and very importantly, observations of stream conditions and water quality um, by various uh, uh, groups who have been working out in the watershed, uh, including uh, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, California Sea Grant, Boulders RCD, and OEI staff. Um, I also relied heavily on um, uh, LIDAR uh, and uh, being able to try to interpret the, the LIDAR and, uh, and, and also supplemented that with some historical aerial photo work to distinguish stream reaches with distinct differences as related to fish habitat, um, either existing or potential. Um, so uh, the work products from this are uh, basically uh, having distinguished and describing stream reaches with these dis distinct differences, which we think are important for 
dis discriminating among uh, habitat values. Uh, once having identified those, um, then I, uh, determining what kinds of habitat restoration and enhancement objectives make sense in those different stream classes. So this is a, a map of the, um, of the watershed with uh, some skinny colored lines representing these different uh, hydrogeomorphic stream classes. Uh, and I'm just gonna run through them real quick. Lower Atascadero Marsh and Wetlands. Uh, Sylvan Creek is down here a little, uh, little tributary. Uh, this is the middle Atascadero entrenched reach. This is Honeve Creek. This is Redwood Creek, whoops. Um, these purple lines are all something called Honeve tributaries, which most of the purple lines are except for Walker Creek over here, which uh, we, we've called a, a Honeve tributary for convenience. Um, the significance of these purple lines different than the, the brown lines of the Atascadero tributaries is that it's possible that those uh, the, the Honeve tributaries could have fish habitat in them. Uh, they probably do. Um, they have good, good stream flow. They have variable habitat conditions, um, but we haven't seen much of it. So we're not really sure uh, exactly what's there, but those are called out separately as potentially providing uh, habitat for fish because fish have a, a reasonable chance of being able to get there unlike the uh, upper Atascadero tributaries that are blocked by known barriers. Um, the, uh, the, this uh, other green line here is called the upper Atascadero intermittent. And uh, uh, that is a, a green line along with the green line down here for lower Atascadero in that there may be uh, uh, fish passage issues owing to the, uh, the riparian conditions and wetland conditions that surround those parts of the channel network. Um, and then uh, the other one I haven't mentioned is Upper Atascadero Entrenched, which is um, uh, different than Honeve in many respects, but also not too dissimilar, such that it, it could have fish use in it. Um, it's probably not as wet as Honeve and access to it is not as good for fish. Some of the information we could get from the LIDAR that was helpful in this was doing a slope map. Um, these are uh, very low slopes, uh, uh, zero to about 3% in most cases. Some of the areas have very low slope gradients around here like Occidental Road, down here below Green Valley Road, very flat areas, sluggish flows, um, and uh, steeper in the headwaters. Another uh, thing we could get from the, the LIDAR was uh, a degree of entrenchment, which has various definitions. I'm, I'm using that term loosely here. And on the map here is shown uh, the, the bank height, uh, basically the depth of channel up to the top of the bank. Um, and you can see in Honeve Creek and uh, this middle reach of Atascadero, uh, the, the bank heights get up above 10 feet and it's, uh, it's the channel is quite incised and uh, in some cases uh, pre-isolated from floodplain. You can see here in uh, the Regal, Regal, Regal Park reach and some of uh, upper Atascadero, the degree of entrenchment is less. And all these yellow areas, we just call it undefined. The LIDAR doesn't extend uh, up in these tributaries up here or in Walker Creek and down here. Uh, the channel definition is too mushy to identify a bank height, and there really isn't much bank height there. Um, quick look at aerial photos. Uh, we've seen some of this imagery before. This is the 1942 aerial imagery, uh, which as far as we know is the oldest available, and uh, the confluence of Green Valley and Tascadero is down here. Going up Atascadero, we up here to Occidental Road. Can see that there are uh, some some identifiable kind of broad looking maybe swaley type channels um, but not a whole lot of vegetation or not uh, overwhelming amounts of vegetation and you can see in this 2018 image a lot of these same areas are are uh, very different kinds of vegetation and uh, much of the channel obscured although there are places where you can see that uh, some of these threads of the channel are still there uh, with, with some certainty. Okay, now I'm just gonna try to cover quickly 
uh, at least a, a quick snip of each of these channel types. And I'm really gonna have to go fast here. So I'm not gonna um, cover all these points. Uh, the lower Atasco marsh, Atascadero marsh and wetlands is, is really dominated by this wetland vegetation. Um, the, the flows spread out across the floodplain in the winter. Uh, this has created uh, a, a variety of water quality problems and navigational problems for fish. So it isn't a very good uh, environment for fish for those reasons. Although these are also the kinds of places where we would expect it to be really good rearing habitat for fish um, because it's slow water of, uh, of a certain depth. And presumably there are food sources, but the water quality conditions kind of trump that, uh, that expectation. Uh, these are um, the LIDAR hillshade images that just give you some sense of the, the texture of the, of the topography in the uh, lower Atascadero, it's, I was saying it's kind of mushy. You can see some channel definition in places. Uh, this Lake Grayton is enclosed by, by dikes. You go a little farther upstream towards Grayton Road, you can see you know, the, the, where the roads cross the, the valley floor. And the, you know, there's a blue line here that sort of is supposedly a channel location, but you can't really find much of a channel anywhere in these images. Um, uh, very, very indistinct. Um, going farther upstream, uh, getting up to uh, the, the end of this geomorphic unit is basically this spot here where you see a pretty well-defined channel crossing under Occidental Road, and you get to a point here and it just kind of dead ends. It actually kind of makes a right-hand turn, and then you see kind of a splay of different channels, and uh, you know, th this is basically where we begin the next hydrogeomorphic unit, um, which is called the Middle and Tascadero Entrenched Hydrogeomorphic Unit. Um, and it doesn't have great water quality. It's survivable by, survivable by fish to, to some degree. It has some deep channels and it has some characteristics that would be good for rearing habitat. It does have a tendency to get pretty dry. And at the downstream end, it's, it's, uh, the water quality isn't very good. There is uh, you know, some gravel, it's mostly sort of silty sandy material and uh, it's got some organics in it. So this is kind of a, a migration corridor. It's probably not very good fish habitat because of the water quality problems, um, similar to the, the unit downstream. Um, here's some more historic aerial photography. In this case, we've got 1952 compared to 2018. Um, Here's Occidental Road. Um, uh, you can see one of the interesting things here in this area between Mill Station and Occidental. We didn't have this, uh, this interesting ski lake here in 1952. And uh, the, the main channel of the Tascaro Creek now kind of hugs the east shore of that uh, ski lake. And you can see that it used to be somewhere out here more in the middle of uh, the valley and there's this other subsidiary channel over here. So we know things have changed substantially at various times. Uh, downstream of Oxdale Road, you can see some channel straightening as well uh, that looks like efforts to, to drain, uh, improve drainage in those lower reaches. Um, so we, we know there's been a, a long history of manipulation here. Um, here's some more of the LiDAR hill shades. You can see the channel up close to the, the, the water ski lake, but out on the floodplain, still these kind of similar kind of features of, uh, of some old relic channels that uh, probably do still flow some water um, when they're collecting it from uh, the edges of the valley. Um, but you get a sense of, uh, you know, at least a, a well-defined channel that you don't see in the, in the area downstream. Okay, now uh, Honeve Creek, which is uh, probably the, the best fish habitat in the watershed, kind of without much question. Uh, it has sustained flow with good water quality. It has, it has gravel, which is uh, what uh, is necessary for fish to spawn. It, it makes some pretty nice ripple pool habitat. It's got some pretty decent riparian vegetation. It's got some wood in it, it could, uh, it could be improved, but it's, uh, it's, it, it's not bad. It's got some, uh, some areas where um, uh, there, there are 
homes and, and roads real close. And there's uh, some bank erosion problems um, and probably at some other some other issues with uh, people living close by the creek. Um, uh, here's some, some of the LIDAR hillshade for Honeeve. You can see the creek is much more sinuous. Um, and uh, it is also entrenched and incised as, as the other uh, downstream channel is. Although I, it doesn't appear that there's been any sort of uh, dredging in particular in this reach. I think it's just been incising for other reasons. Um, Redwood Creek has been discussed. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a mini Honeeve Creek, but it's not quite as flat and not quite as consistent in its uh, presentation of habitat. It has some areas of obvious, uh, probably rapid incision um, that are, are somewhat curious, but it does have a lot of nice vegetation around it and uh, mostly decent water quality. And uh, I would say in general, uh, relatively good habitat. Um, Upper Atascadero Intermittent is uh, the reach basically through Regal Park. And uh, it is a channel that uh, is difficult for fish to move through. At least that is the, the, the general belief from the various uh, people and groups who have looked at that, that creek. It, it appears to uh, tend to uh, go dry a little more readily than some other areas. And so we think this is probably uh, a, a, a kind of a reach scale partial barrier to migration, or maybe more of a more of a barrier than that. Uh, the, the aerial photography history is interesting. In this 1952 photo, you can see very clearly that uh, that uh, the, the, this channel has been uh, straightened and and probably excavated to improve drainage, and uh, the the hillshade. Uh, LIDAR still shows that, that pattern. You can see it's kind of evolved uh, geomorphic processes being what they are. It's trying to make it wiggle, but um, that channel got established by humans and uh, it's still kind of the dominant one, but you can see there are other floodplain features out there. Uh, my understanding is that this reach tends to flood uh, uh, during big runoff events and not drain very quickly. Uh, the upper Atascadero uh, entrenched tributaries, or not tributaries, the entrenched reach, uh, as I said, is maybe not too dissimilar from Honeeve. It's not as flat, um, and uh, it it's certainly uh, seems to not have as good a water supply, although it does have water in it, and it had water in it during these uh, severe drought conditions, at least locally. So um, if, if fish can get there, it seems like it's, it's possibly habitat for them. Um, and here's uh, some of the, the LIDAR hill shades for that. And, uh, and finally, the, uh, the, the Honeeve and Atascadero tributaries. I think the main thing to realize is that these, these uh, major tributary streams are delivering water and, and sediment, including gravel, to the reaches downstream, which create the habitat uh, that the fish can use. Um, and uh, this is my segue slide to the conclusion here. Um, th this is uh, the, the um, habitat restoration recommendations, where we have the um, all the hydrogeomorphic units on uh, the column to the left. And then uh, across the top, we've identified types of restoration activities, uh, improving juvenile rearing habitat, uh, uh, improving pools, uh, reducing stream bank instability and channel incision, improving fish passage, improving spawning habitat, creating enhancing off-channel habitat, stream flow enhancement, which could be this groundwater recharge uh, thing we were talking about earlier, uh, fine sediment source reduction, uh, improving water quality, and promoting uh, health of the riparian corridor. At this point, um, we wanted to uh, uh, bring John Green in to discuss some of the kinds of activities. And uh, I believe uh, Sierra and John uh, are going to 
uh, jump in here as well. But uh, I, I think the thing to note here in this color-coded slide that you can focus on are that the, 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 the pink squares with high priorities in them match up pretty well with uh, the description of these habitat or these hydrogeomorphic units and, and where, where uh, improvements are needed. Um, you can see in the uh, juvenile rearing habitat, we've highlighted basically the, the streams where we, we think the fish are now or are most likely to be. Um, improving fish passage, we've identified um, uh, the lower Atascadero Marsh, which has its sort of special sort of fish passage problems, which is mostly a, a water quality issue, or at least partly a water quality issue. Um, and uh, the upper task there intermittent is also sort of a reach scale uh, uh, migration barrier kind of question. Um, stream flow enhancement, we've identified many areas, but uh, of interest are some of the areas farther up the watershed, not necessarily immediately adjacent to the fish bearing streams where we have those uh, those high rankings for the upper Atascadero and, and uh, Huni tributaries. Um, and then improving water quality in that lower Atascadero marsh wetlands is a high priority because it has been shown to be a, a problem for, uh, for fish. I'm gonna stop. Thank you, Matt. That was a marathon, thank you. <laughs> um, John, do you wanna, do you have additional information that's I know you had the slide as well. Uh, I actually don't have that slide, but I'm going to refer to it. Okay. Should I uh, close off my screen? Yes, please. So is that visible to everybody? Yes. All right, so um, referring back to the uh, restoration recommendations matrix that Matt just showed, um, that'll appear in the study report um, for this for this uh, study of, of coho salmon habitat in Tascadero Creek. So it categorizes um, different types of restoration projects and lists them for each uh, one of those hydrogeomorphic units that Matt discussed. Um, and then ranks them in terms of their priority. How important is it to do each of these project types in the various different reach types? So I'm just gonna go through um, really quickly, hopefully, um, and talk about, uh, sorry, I'm gonna arrange things here, and talk about the different types of projects. Anyway. Um, talk about the different types of projects that, that might be implemented. So for in-stream habitat projects, which include those under the headings of improving juvenile re rearing habitat and spawning habitat, most commonly we like to uh, implement projects that place large wood in the stream and enhance the characteristics that, that we're looking to enhance. Um, with these projects, we're, we're looking to increase channel complexity. And obviously these are gonna be in the reaches where uh, we want spawning and uh, rearing to occur. And it looks like I'm sharing my presenter screen, but I don't really care at this point. We're so far over time. Um, so you can read along with me as I go through my speech. Um, so, you know, people want to tend to want to see a, a, a neat stream channel, but that's exactly what salmon don't want to want to have in terms of habitat. Um, salmon evolved in, in watersheds with, with lots of trees near the streams either redwoods and firs uh, or hardwood trees of riparian corridors. So evolutionarily, they are adapted to, um, to streams with wood in them. So when tree, trees fall into the creek, they deflect the energy of stream flow. They cause areas of scour, um, they create pools, they create riffles, and it's these different habitats that the salmon take advantage of. Um, wood also provides cover from predators. It provides substrate for, um, for insects and various invertebrates that are a food source for salmon. So in essence, a messy channel is a healthy channel for fish. So when we work on uh, improving spawning and rearing habitats, often we're putting large wood in the streams. Um, our projects don't exactly mimic nature because we want the wood to stay in place uh, and be stable. We don't want wood moving and potentially creating 
erosion issues or other problems downstream. <clears throat> and uh, so we tend to anchor these wood structures with large rock with boulders. Um, and they vary in size and shape and configuration depending on what we're trying to accomplish. So that, those are the types of projects you might see if we're trying to address spawning and rearing habitat. Again, as I said, mostly in the upstream reaches in, in the case of Atascadero. Um, when we're talking about channel incision, um, <clears throat> incision is a process where the stream digs its channel deeper. And as Matt was saying, the creek ends up flowing down in this trench that concentrates uh, and focuses the energy of flow on the stream bed and banks. It creates these over steep and stream banks like you see in the photo, and those tend to collapse over time. Um, a lot of Atascadero Creek and its tributaries are, are incised, as are a lot of streams all over California. Um, and material that's eroded from the banks is moved downstream and deposits in the lower gradient portions of the stream, as in the Atascadero Swamp. That degrades habitat and causes other problems, including uh, essentially filling in existing channels and making it so that fish have a hard time getting through those areas. So to address incision, we often use some of the same techniques that we use when we're talking about improving habitat. We want to slow down flow. We want to reduce the energy of flow so that the stream doesn't erode its bed and banks quite so much. Um, and the way to do that is to increase the roughness of the channel. Uh, it's, you know, we'll, we'll end up putting wood in the creek. Um, and sometimes we will uh, physically excavate or remove some of the bank material to allow the, the creek to flow in a wider channel. Um, off-channel habitat is, uh, is a type of project that we are, uh, that you would want to see in areas where the fish are using uh, the creeks for rearing. So salmon spend the first year of their lives in the streams that they were hatched in. And during the first winter, they tend to seek out areas with abundant food supplies. Um, the bigger the fish are when they run out to the ocean, uh, the more likely it is they're going to survive their two years in the ocean and return to spawn. So these off-channel feeding areas are really important, uh, especially in Green Valley Creek, which has you know, a fair amount of uh, off-channel uh, feeding areas and produces some of the biggest, healthiest fish. Um, so these are areas that flood during moderate and large rainstorms. And when they do, that flooding of otherwise dry areas produces really a large amounts of insects and invertebrates to provide a food source for the fish. Um, that also provides low velocity areas where the fish can rest during high, high flows. We've Im implemented a few um, projects that make these areas more fish friendly. And the slide shows uh, a project we implemented in Lower Green Valley Creek. Um, they expand the area that floods in the winter, provide pathways for fish to reach those areas. And probably most critically, uh, pathways that allow the fish to return to the channel as the flood recedes. So it's easier to build these types of projects in areas where the stream isn't quite so incised. Um, and we have several projects of, that, of this kind in development in the area of the confluence of Atascadero and Green Valley Creeks, um, including a project that's going to address the sediment accumulation or hopefully will address the sediment accumulation just upstream of the confluence. Um, fish passage barriers. Matt talked a little bit about these. I, I'm not going to spend much time on them. Um, but really, we're talking about two different types of barriers in uh, Tascadero Creek. One is these physical barriers that usually are, re are related to culverts um, or other road crossings where there's actually a, a, uh, a drop in the, uh, the bed of the stream. So it creates a, a step, essentially, that the fish can't get over. Um, the most a uh, dramatic one of these in Atascadero, I think, is the Barnett Valley Road Crossing, where there's approximately a 12-foot drop out of the end of the culvert. Obviously, a salmon is never going to be able to jump 12 feet. Uh, and so the projects that we implement, and the, the photo is one in Upper Green Valley that we implemented a few years ago, um, it, they attempt to take those large drops and make them into a series of small drops that fish can, can get up. Um, a second type of of barrier to fish passage is water quality. Um, and, and Matt also talked quite a bit about that as did Sierra when she was discussing water quality. This is really a problem in, in the very lowermost reaches of Atascadero um, where you have essentially uh, a, something of a lack of a stream channel and an abundance of vegetation resulting in 
very uh, low dissolved oxygen and probably other, other issues with water quality as well. And I should add that one other type of, of um, barrier to fish passage that we see in Atascadero Creek in the lower gradient reaches is the lack of a, of a main stream channel. Um, when you don't have a central channel, it makes it harder for the fish to migrate through that area, either upstream or downstream, because the flow is so spread out over a large area, there's very little uh, flow signal for the fish to follow, whether it's adults uh, migrating upstream or um, juvenile fish migrating downstream. So stream flow enhancement, um, Matt talked a little bit about uh, uh, runoff retention projects and the potential for those. I'm gonna focus on the human use end of stream flow. Um, obviously there's a lot of people in the Atascadero watershed and everybody either has a well or is pulling water out of the creek, sometimes both. Um, fish can't survive if there's no water in the creek. And since they spend their, their first year in the creek before they migrate, they need enough flow uh, to survive all the way through the summer and the fall. Obviously, that's also that that coincides with the growing season. And in some areas, people pump enough water either directly from the creek or from its aquifer that stream flow can drop to levels that can't sustain fish, or stream flow can go away and the creek can dry up completely. The methods that we've used to address these conditions uh, usually have to do with working cooperatively with landowners to provide either alternative sources of water or water storage or both. Uh, and the type of project that really is kind of a no brainer in our, uh, in our neck of the woods is rainwater catchment. We have a really well defined um, drought that lasts six months or more every year, but we also have a pretty well defined rainy season and, it, and it's fairly reliable in terms of the amount of rain we get. Um, you know, maybe the last two years notwithstanding. So collecting rainwater during the winter for use in the summer is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, we've implemented a number of these projects um, all over West County, and what we usually are aiming to do is address people's uh, non-potable water use with rainwater that's captured in the, in the winter and stored for summer use. And the last type of project I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about this one really briefly, um, is water quality. Um, you know, as has been discussed earlier, uh, water quality in Lower Atascadero really does pose a barrier to fish migration through that area. And if the fish can't get through Lower Atascadero, they're not gonna reach the ideal, you know, spawning and rearing habitat that is in the upper part of the watershed. Um, in Lower Atascadero Creek, you have an abundance of vegetation that vegetation is essentially a perennial wetland. And when that vegetation dies, it rots and it sucks up the oxygen out of the water and makes it so that it is essentially deadly to fish. Um, I think that, that addressing this uh, water quality issue in Lower Atascadero is going to be fairly complicated because we need to do it in a way that doesn't degrade the quality of the wetland in that area. Um, but that said, I think there are approaches that we can take um, because fish only need to move through that area during a couple of different times of the year when they're migrating upstream as adults and when they're migrating out to the ocean as juveniles. So really we're talking about the winter and, and the spring. Um, and I think that the, uh, the type of project that we're gonna wanna implement in those areas is, are gonna be projects that uh, keep the water moving essentially because water quality is gonna be better if the water is in motion as opposed to just sitting. So that's my last slide, and I'll give it back to Sierra. Thanks. Anyone who has hang, hung on this long, I appreciate it, and I'm sorry we've gone so long. Um, I've used this metaphor a number of times. The Atascadero is really like a many-headed hydra, and that every question we ask, we greet with three new questions. Um, and this is just how basically this entire study has gone is that everything that we've kind of delved into, we found additional things that don't make sense or didn't, weren't how we thought they would be and that we need to look at further. Um, and this is just the first of many studies that we are currently doing. Um, we are designing a project um, in collaboration with um, all the folks who have um, spoken tonight on uh, trying to address the sediment accumulation area at the bottom end um, down near where the Great and Community Services District is to try to take a look at what removing some of that sediment accumulation would look like to try to um, restore more of a, a dominant channel with seasonal wetlands, changing that hydro period. 
um, down there. And we are also working on trying to understand um, reconnecting Walker Creek, which is the tributary that comes in right at Occidental Road. Um, trying to look at some of the modifications that Matt described um, on the LIDAR there, that there's just been a lot of um, channel changes that have occurred through there. So, um, and in addition to this, there's water quality monitoring that's continuing as well. So I've tried to answer a number of the questions that were in the chat. If anyone um, would, has additional questions that they would like to ask, um, now is the time, please raise your hand or um, indicate um, in the chat that you're interested in asking a question. Um, and one of the questions that came up earlier that I was answering while Matt was troubleshooting his um, presentation, we will be sending out these presentations to uh, link to the presentations to everyone who's attended. And we'll also be posting the recording of this meeting um, on uh, YouTube that we'll post a link on our website to as well. That just won't happen until the beginning of January when we'll also be posting um, the report that came out of this, which is the sub watershed assessment report, that chapter in the Green Valley Watershed Management Plan and that will be available in January as well. So if you're dying to learn more about this, you have 200 pages to peruse of all of the things we've been presenting on. Are there any questions from folks that are participating? Um, I see one additional. So Kimberly had had some questions about um, whether or not we were studying water diversions through um, the watershed to protect some of the stream flows. And um, the answer to that question was, we are not looking directly at diversions, but we are trying to um, collaborate with folks primarily in the, the upper portion of the Honeave um, sub-watershed that includes Sexton, Upper Honeave, and Redwood Creeks on opportunities to um, look at alternative water sources um, to be able to get um, some uh, tanks in for summer water usage for rainwater storage that would allow folks to, um, if they have riparian diversions or if they're using shallow wells to rely less on those in the late summer to try to protect some of those, um, to protect stream flow. And protecting stream flow also helps with a lot of those other water quality issues that we've talked about tonight. Um, so we are, we've sent out uh, restoration interest surveys to folks up in that upper watershed, and we're working on a couple of grant applications that would allow us to start designing some of those projects um, in those high priority areas. Thank you. Um, hold on one second. So there's a follow-up question from Kimberly. Um, it says, um, I think so. I think I answered that about the summer diversion. So it would be an opportunity to protect stream flow through relying on those stored water, uh, alternative water sources, rather than um, on these shallow water, um, either the shallow wells or uh, direct surface water di diversions. So that would be that would be the plan that would would be to exchange those to protect stream flow. And then Paul, uh, hi Paul, asked if there's anything um, being addressed about invasive plant species. Um, so that is a good question. We have nothing other than that we're aware of them and that we know that they are issues. Um, once you get invasive plant species in there, it's tough to do much about. Um, he's asking specifically about willows, blackberries, and acacia. Um, the acacia, I think, are things that depends on how close they are to the stream bank about whether or not there's something that landowners um, can remove um, on their own. I don't know that they're super pervasive throughout the watershed. Um, but if they are, that's certainly something um, that could be taken a look at. But I think the bigger issue are the blackberries, the Himalayan non-native blackberry is definitely um, an issue all through that lower section. Um, this year, there were some of them that I was going through that were probably 10, 12 feet high, um, and they're just all the way throughout there. Um, landowners can look at trying to control those. It's incredibly difficult, labor intensive, and um, difficult to control those with, you know, by hand by going in and cutting the blackberries back, and it's a never-ending process because you have to stay on top of it. Um, so I think that that is definitely I, I don't have any good answers other than being able to try to look at large-scale cooperative um, removal of some of those invasive plants 
The willows are a tough call because they are a native and um, they, they certainly, I know that for a lot of folks, um, they've really moved into a lot of these areas that are becoming uh, wetter longer. So they're spreading out into those areas. And again, they're difficult to control by hand um, or going in, we have chainsaws or hand tools, um, which is what you need to do um, with in most of those sensitive biological areas. You can't use like heavy equipment, um, but looking at that, you know, having to look at your entire property and trying to assess how to address those. Does anybody else have any tools for plants for invasive plant removal stuff that I may have missed? It hasn't been something that we've been real successful at being able to find funding for or being able to try to do in a large coordinated effort because um, it also requires everybody to participate in order to really um, nail down <laughs> removing those. Um, so Paul, follow up with me. Ma managed, managed fire, possibly. That sounds really scary to me, but I'm sure that we <laughs> used to do that. Um, it, it's a really wet area too. I'm not sure how useful fire would be. Maybe it would actually be a lot safer there. Um, and Larry has a question in the chat. Um, are there any projects to increase shade canopy since water temperature is associated with O2 levels? Um, again, our, the water temperatures are actually really great, um, which is not to say that there's not potential need for um, more shading. There's riparian vegetation and shading has other um, benefits in addition, but water temperature has not been a concern. Um, the uh, oxygen depletion, it seems more of a depletion issue um, than it is a water temperature um, availability of the, the water to hold the dissolved oxygen. It's that it's once it's in there, it's being depleted by all of these biological and chemical oxygen demands from what we can tell so far. Um, so if there's interest in trying to do, we do have riparian enhancement as one of the um, restoration recommendations in the table that Matt showed. And there certainly are some areas where there's very thin riparian um, corridor just because of the disconnection from the creek and the floodplain. Um, so definitely looking at, at planting some additional shade cover um, for if those you know, if that, that bank becomes unstable and we lose those trees, um, that is definitely recommended. Can I, can I just draw attention to Kimberly Burr's question again? I'm not sure yes. we really addressed what her question was, which was by, by uh, changing water sources, like, you know, the rain storage tanks, so if somebody's not using a well or diverting a stream, you get that water back in the stream. And her question is, is there any way to keep that water in the stream from just being used by somebody else who has a, a pump in the stream. And I don't think there is any uh, great way to do that. I mean, the water rights system is supposed to give everybody their allocation and their due, um, but it's, that, that gets really tricky to, uh, to, to try to preserve enhanced stream flow for in-stream benefits and uh, you know it, it's hard to keep somebody who isn't uh, interested in, in following the, the rules and regulations from, from using that but that, that could be a, an issue. I would just follow up with the RCD's approach to that would be trying to provide more of the, the storage opportunities for more folks so that if there is a need for more water than people are currently you know being able to use or if we're asking them to reduce the reliance on um, the surface water or shallow well um, connected water than trying to get additional storage opportunities for folks. So um, that would be the way that we would try to approach it would be to try to head that off rather than try to figure out where that problem was happening was just to provide that, that those tools for people um, who would need them. And then Mary, there's a question for, from Mary from Matt um, asking, could undersized road culverts and perched outflow be contributing to stream incision? You're muted, Matt. Do you have yeah, um, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, that could locally cause some incision, but I don't think those particular, um, those particular mechanisms would be sufficient to do sort of systematic channel incision, which kind of seems to be what's happened here and also in, in, in Green Valley and Purrington Creek, uh, Upper Green Valley and Purrington Creek. And, uh, I think the uh, combination of hydro modification through urbanization and 
and just sort of uh, more intense land use in the watershed, along with the tendency for uh, you know long term for improved drainage starting down in the valley that kind of migrates upstream and probably a tendency for people to prevent wood from accumulating in streams. I think all those things together may be enough to have driven it in that direction. But um, I know John Green and I have talked about this uh, back and forth for, for a while. I, I, I suspect uh, those are the kind of the, the, the list of, of culprits, but John may have some additional thoughts. No, I think you're you're uh, you're right on with that. I, I don't think that those those kinds of local scour that you see with uh, with road crossings are really going to contribute that much to the sort of systematic um, channel incision that we see. Are there any additional questions? I know we're egregiously over at this point. You all deserve marsh badges for sticking in here this long. Um, are there any additional questions? If any of them come up and you think about them while you're in the shower, like all good questions come to people, um, feel free to email me, please. Um, and I will, if I don't know the answer to something or if it's directed at one of the other presenters, I will forward that to them. Um, this is ongoing for all of us who are in this. This is kind of, you know, nobody's done at this point. Um, we're really excited, but you obviously go all night um, to keep learning about this and to keep sharing information. So if there's observations that you have or questions that you have that arise, please contact us because we would love to keep engaging with the community and hopefully be identifying more of these opportunities to um, improve this habitat and create a situation that allows us to get fish to and from that beautiful Redwood Honeeds Creek area and hopefully um, Upper Atascadero Arrow as well. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys. Have a wonderful evening. Um, and again, this will be posted. Um, we're going to send a link out to the presentations to everyone who attended. And we will also be posting information on our website at goldridgercd.org um, in addition to the report. Thank you.